Welcome to the Davis Media Access Program in the studio. My name is Bill Buchanan. I'm the guest host for this program. Normally, I uh, have a radio program for KDRT, which is also part of Davis Media Access, a program called Davisville. But I'm here today to talk to Danny Tomasello. Uh, Danny is the founder, and uh, I don't know, you probably do a lot of different things, for the uh, Davis Music Fest, right. which just wrapped up its third season. So, Danny, thank you for coming by the show. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for guest hosting. You're, I, I recognize your voice on the radio. It's very soothing, so this should be, uh, this should be easy. A couple well, of radio guys uh, on television. <laughs> yeah, that's true, folks. This could get very amusing here. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, Davis Music Fest just wrapped up its third year in June of 2013. So uh, you had 13 venues, 65 bands, about 2,000 people came, I think. Uh, yeah, those are rough, well, rough what figures. That? Yeah. <laughs> so how'd it go this year? Wrap it up for us. Well, I think it went really well. It was, uh, it was a success in the sense that um, there were no major glitches um, once the fest got rolling. Uh, everybody that came out had a great time. Um, we ended up, we, we, we compensate every musician that comes out. So I always like to, to talk about that because um, I think it's, it's not a free so they get thing. paid for their so time. They right? get paid for their time. It's not a lot of money in a lot of cases, but you know, if you if you and but we do feed everybody. So you know, 253 musicians, I believe, were out there um, in one day. Well, I guess one and a half days. And yeah, it's all day Saturday, right into the evening, and then half a day on Sunday. Yeah. So this year was the first year we had a second day, and it started at um, 11 a.m. at the Davis Arts Center, and then a couple sets down there or up there, I should say, and then everyone went downtown to the outside venues um, between Delta, Venus, and uh, the Armadillo stage started around 3. And then some of the normal, regular venues in town that host bands, um, they got in full swing around 6 or 7 and played till closing or midnight or 1 or whatever. So you said this is the first year you had uh, a second day. Right. So how does this compare to last year or the first year? Uh, you have more people? You had more bands? We did have, we did have more people, so we're growing. Um, unfortunately, we had a lot of people that were, were participating uh, without paying to come in. And so I, you know, we, we envisioned more people would be buying tickets either pre-sale or would come down because it was a benefit. Um, so that would, I would say would be the one, the one overestimation on our part was how many people would be um, coming down to, to support the whole thing. So your point is you had 2,000 people, but they weren't 2,000 paying. Right. And so did you make your expenses? Uh, we fell short of expenses, actually, this year. Okay. But not, not a lot. We needed about 100 more paying customers, and we would have we would have covered everything, and you know, 200 more, and we would have matched our donation to the Davis Schools Arts Foundation last year, which was 2,500 bucks. Yeah, we should make that point that when, at least when you're covering your expenses, this is a fundraiser for right. uh, arts in the schools. Yep, and so you know, it's it's funny because we last year we did we had about 1,500 people came out, and there were more people had paid um, this year. I don't know, it was, it was kind of interesting. We had a lot of people store, sort of standing around the outside stage. We had people that were standing out in front of any wine bar. We had people coming through Central Park the next day. But, it, you know, that was sort of a, we knew that going in, that Central yeah. Park on Sunday, those bands were part of Live Strong. So Live Strong Challenge is a bike ride that happens in town to raise money for um, victims and their families of cancer. And turned out in 2012, that the Music Fest and Live Strong Challenge were on the same day. So um, they actually reached out to us and wanted to make sure it wasn't a coincidence in 2013. So we partnered up with them. We actually booked the bands for outside. They um, normally had DJs, and, and it was just sort of a, you know an after party. And we said, well, how about live music for that after party instead? And we'll put them on the bill, and then festival goers with their wristbands can go. And that all worked, except for you know they don't close down Central Park, really. Yeah, well, yeah, that's part of the problem, isn't it, with an outdoor festival is that yeah. you can have people listen and right. they don't necessarily have to buy a ticket. Right. And you know, frankly, it's fine. I mean, yeah. we, you know, it's, it's, some people don't have the means to do it and it's, it's cool that we're promoting, you know, Davis as a music loving community and what we need to do next year is just have that factored in. You, well, know. you know, and a little later I'd like to talk to you about your plans for next year, but, uh, but I wanted to ask first, I mean, uh, why do you do this? I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, the way the answer is obvious, you know, right? You love music, and, yeah. and there's a lot of talent you want to bring here, and we're in California. There's yeah. all sorts of talent coming through here. But, but why do you do it? It's a lot of work. 
It is a lot of work. Um, I think the, the reason I like to do it is there frankly was the opportunity presented itself. I was in a good position and I thought, you know, the time is right for this kind of thing. Um, I was just, you know, I just go to a lot of shows. I know some of the venue owners um, really have respect for, you know, what they're doing as far as bringing small bands to town. Um, listen to KDRT, listen to KDVS, go to some of those shows. And there's just, you know, I was always going to these shows and thinking, God, there's, there's so much great music out there and it'd be nice if there was a you know, bigger sort of spotlight on at least one day a year. And um, I had friends that were working for the Downtown Business Association and I'm a little older than the average, you know, KDVS showgoer, let's say. And so I was able to kind of connect the dots that way and figured, you know, this is, this is gonna be a cool thing for me to just get involved in, but I had no idea that three years later there'd be 67 bands. I mean, that wasn't really part of the plan going into uh, this whole thing. Um, my so friend. But How did you end up with 67 then, if that was more than you expected? Did you just sort of keep booking people? And <laughs> yeah, it's funny because the people on the booking committee were like, really, you, you, know, you added another one? And um, it's, it's not like it's the Danny show. I mean, there definitely yeah. is a booking committee and we settle on what we're gonna do. Um, this year, we had to replace a venue that went out of business last year. So we added Pence Gallery and then Davis Art Center had contacted me about doing something, and then Mandavi contacted us about doing something, and next thing you know, it was you know we had a lot more venues that were interested. So, um, well, and that's a successful, absolutely. That, that's, I mean, that's a sign of success is that you For have sure. all these people wanting to do this. And uh, I'm not a musician, but I got to believe that a festival that pays every musician for performing is. Uh, a mark above the ones that are just, hey, come play for free. Come play for, right. And, and we, we'll collect the tips. We absolutely want to make it an experience for the, um, all the musicians and the venue owners. I've said from day one, I want people to wake up the next morning and go, wow, that was awesome. I'm really glad we did that. Uh, you know, let's do it again if we can. That's really the, that's the bottom line success. If people wake up the next morning stoked, they went, great. Um, but, you know, to get back to how do we get that big, it was, a matter of, um, you know, the booking committee got bigger this year and we had, you know, offers out and then it was plugging in some of the holes were, oh, you know, this, are you all filled up yet? A lot of the musicians themselves and, you know, would, would have friends in other bands and say, you know, they've heard about this, they'd love to play, I think they'd fit well here or there. So we, we just had a, you know, and it was like, well, we could start a little earlier in that venue, let's plug them in. And so it just, but at one point, yeah, it was like, okay. Okay, so, so I've got to ask, is, is 67 uh, more than you're going to want for next year? Or? Yes. Okay, yeah. so you'll dial it back. Any well, idea how many you... Well, the reason for that is not because of um, that 67 was too much. Uh -huh. I think it was, um, it was, you know, the festival goer felt a little overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, and what happened was, um, even with the people that were sort of standing around watching without going in the venues, people were spread too thin. You know, it was just, it was, and the, and the changeover times weren't, were, were pretty back to back. We had like 15 or 20 minute changeover times, which meant that people didn't, you know, okay, where should we go next? They kind of got caught up in whatever. So okay. I think by having, you know, if we go back to say 50 bands, I think would be a better goal and space it out a little better, have some nice, change over times, um, and give people the opportunity to get places. That's the biggest feedback we had. So not, not quite as compressed, I'm getting a sense. Yeah, not quite as compressed and not so many options. Would you still do it over a couple of days? Yeah, I would definitely do it over a couple of days. Um, I think the Sunday component was, was really um, just a natural, even if Livestrong didn't come in. Um, I remember after the first two fests, waking up on Sunday and feeling like this big lull of... No, you just did this big thing the day before, yeah. it's still the weekend, but yeah. there's it's Sunday, it's like, ah, it should be so nice to go somewhere. And, right. you know, Delta Venus, um, it provides such a great atmosphere um, with the shade and the outside, and we had classical music, and then um, Lauren Cole Norton played, and um, well, now it was I, just real nice. This leads into, I wanted to ask you what some of the highlights were mm -hmm. of the festival this year. Wh which ones were, and it could be performances, it could be moments you just thought was really cool, it could be, I don't know, someone you saw in the audience. The very, very best moment, I think, of the day, I was riding my bike from the Davis Art Center and heading down, and, and we had just kicked off um, the first two bands, and they were, you know, geared towards kids. So, um, These that, are the ones at the Art Center. There was the Art Center, yeah, it was the Hoots and uh, 
music mat, the whole nine yards, and they're great for kids and people know them. And that was another, you know, can't charge really out there at Community Park at Davis Arts Center. So it was, and we, we gave it away to kids unintentionally, you know. Yeah. So anyway, I was riding my bike down and, and my phone was just blowing up from all these people that were, hey man, have a great day and let me know if you need me and we're super excited and just tons of friends um, that really weren't even part of the, the organization or the committee ahead of time were just letting me know they, they had my back and that was a real highlight for me. Um, you know, KDRT was and has been a supporter of it all along and I knew that stage was going to be great and that ended up being another real highlight was downstairs at the lodge. Um, uh, in fact, maybe, you know, maybe we'll stop now and let her... Uh, I think we have some footage of yeah, the downstairs stage of the... Uh, yeah. This is... Uh, tell us who this is. So the lodge has two levels, a lower hall and an upper hall. And this is... This is Meisner and Smith. Meisner and Smith. Let's, uh, I was just going to let them play and I'll stop talking. So, yeah, so that was Meisner and Smith in the lower hall, and they're just uh, going to come up here to John Langford in the upper hall. And, um, but yeah, that downstairs space is, uh, was real, real special. Um, oh, by the way, I just want to let people know that um, Sarah is with us here in spirit and two-dimensionally. Oh, well, you, should, you should explain who Sarah is. <laughs> Sarah Ely is one of, uh, she's, she's my, my partner in crime on the uh, Awesome Patrol show. Uh, which is a radio show we have here on KDRT um, from 5 to 6 on Fridays. And that's her with her arm up, right? That's there. her with her arm up, her thumbs up. She was having a great time, and I think that may be the Meisner Smith set, or it could be it could be the start of Sea of Bees. Um, so downstairs, it was Meisner Smith, Sea of Bees, and then John Vanderslice, and uh, he ended up having a... Uh, standing on top of the catered merch table and had, you know, it was a real intimate moment with folks and that that type of thing is, that's definitely a highlight for sure. So, those the, so now you had a couple of challenges too. I mean, anything you put on like this is going to be, uh, you uh, you lost a headliner. Lost a headliner at the Mandavi Center. Um, yeah, it's real unfortunate. I mean, I guess, you know, exhaustion happens with some of these guys. And yeah, I mean, he, he just, canceled. I guess we should explain. I mean, he wasn't literally lost. He was, <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, he canceled the performance. He canceled his whole Northern California tour. Yeah, yeah he was exhausted. He had just uh, been, it was, you know, things happen. That and was uh, J.D. McPherson? J.D. McPherson, right, right. And, and you picked uh, up a new venue. So we picked up a new venue, um, uh, which, you know, before I get into that, do want to mention that one of the other sort of headlining stages was uh, the armadillo outside stage um and the guy named uh, chuck prophet played out there and i think we have a, a clip of that as well um but yes here he is i'm a fan of few words baby and I think by now you heard them all. Woo! I'm a man of few words, baby. And I think by now you heard them all. It's gonna take an aspirin Gonna take one big as my own head Woo! It's gonna take an aspirin, baby Gonna take one big as my own head And so, so <laughs> I'm glad that we showed that. One of the other highlights um, was actually a story um, after his set. And generally in these you know, festival settings, you, 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 know, you have your time slot and that's it. 
And this was the last venue out at, uh, in front of Armadillo. And it was late. You know, we've got sound requirements and everything as far as when we need to shut down. But he was, he how, was how pleading to the yeah. yeah. And he was pleading to the showrunner going, come on, man. These guys are so into it. Let me just, just one more, you know. And so, I mean, the fact that he wanted to go back out is such a huge testament, you know. Um, now, and that, that, now, that sounded pretty good there. Who's, who was Chuck Prophet? I, I, I don't Chuck know. Prophet and the Mission Express, San uh -huh. Francisco rocker. He's, um, he's been around a while. Um, this is a good example of, I, I don't know. You know, I, I, he's not somebody that I booked. So uh, he's yeah, but I mean that, that was a good sound, though. I mean, I, and the fact that it was dark there in the stage and all that. I mean, that sounded like something more. Well, there's than, and that's that's a good point you're bringing up. Um, we hire all professional sound engineers too. Yeah. So nobody, none of the venues have just somebody out there with a PA and figuring it out. Um, so we have sound engineers in all the venues who we also pay. Uh, they, they actually have sound engineers and make the most money in this industry because it doesn't matter who shows up, they get paid. <laughs> so then, There's fewer of them, I suppose. <laughs> that's true. And they, they, they do a great job, so hats off to them. Um, but uh, so Electron Pro Audio was out there. The stage was provided by Grand Affair, who was another sponsor. And Mandavi actually did the lighting. So um, They did the lighting for all the... They did the lighting for that outside stage okay. and actually for the upper hall as well. Mandavi was great about the whole um, J.D. McPherson thing. I mean, they were, they were as bummed out as we were, and um, they really did a great job. Make it, they made good on everybody who has a ticket for J.D. McPherson, can turn it in for a Lyle Lovett ticket, and you get a full refund. Yeah, I saw that. I thought that was pretty exceptional. Real classic. Yeah. It's not like Lyle Lovett is a low-end act. I mean, yeah, he's a pretty no, good definitely, definitely classic But move. Now, you did pick up a new venue, which I suppose was an example where uh, yeah. something that was sort of a curveball, you turned it into something that actually worked out pretty well. Yeah, the, the, the week before the fest was way more stressful than the actual day of the fest, and that was because of J.D. McPherson's troubles. And then uh, we actually lost another band, uh, another unfortunate family incident with one of the band members, just, you know, families first. That's yeah. the bottom line. So when family happens, we're like, you know, do whatever you need to do. And we replaced uh, Joy and Madness with uh, Element Brass Band, sort of, you know, quick last minute thing. And, um, and then the, what you're talking about is the Davis Flea became our new venue. The former venue, they just decided, you know, we've had too many complaints, we don't want any more loud music out here. That was at 4th and L, the other one. Yeah. So that's kind of away from downtown. Yeah, it was away from downtown anyway. It was a total blessing in disguise because uh, the flea space was great and, uh, oh, we're, we're showing some now. That's, uh, that's drive through mystics. You know, I, I got to say, they look like they'd be at home playing in what, I mean, just looking at the venue, looks like kind of a converted garage. Yeah, the the flea space is, I mean, it's a, it's a warehouse that's over by, uh, behind Red Rum Burger. Yeah, on Olive. Olive. Right. And um, that was maybe their second show that they've had there. Um, and fortunately, the gal that runs, or what used to run the uh, space out at Bike Forth, mm -hmm. is also putting on shows here. So it was a pretty, Easy transition. We just didn't know that the flea space was available until it was. It was Wednesday night at 10 o'clock. I got the call that we were going to switch right before Saturday. So that was yeah, a little bit. And, but you kept it all going together. I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, and kudos to um, 2407 Graphics for uh, really rallying behind a new schedule and getting that out. And you know, Copyland isn't a uh, isn't an official sponsor, but man, we re we really lean on Wilson and those guys to turn things around quickly. For and like posters and such. Posters and handbills and yeah, whatever we need printed, they did a they did a great job. So yeah, we we we, we made that happen, turned it around, and it ended up being a real blessing. Like I said, it's much closer, and or like you said rather, and, uh, but you can hop on your bike and go through the the tunnel, and you're right out you're right out there. So yeah, I saw I caught a couple of sets. I didn't catch that drive through Mystics, um, but I had I was lucky. I saw them about a week before out at Luigi's. So you've done three years of these now, um, and there is a lot of music in the area. I mean, there's San Francisco and Sacramento and Davis. Sure. Are you getting the audience you want? The people that are coming out are absolutely the, the audience we want, yes. 
Uh, by design, we do this, no offense to undergrads, but by design, we do this a week after school gets out. Um, and that's oh, not going to change. Why? Because, you know, this isn't picnic day part two. Um, I don't yeah, want people out there for their first beer. This is like, let's, you know, let's do something that rewards the already, the music community that exists here already. It's, you know, let's kind of just expand from that a little bit. And people that go and support shows already, um, bands that are from Davis, from Sacramento, bring in some Bay Area acts from Southern California. We had, you know, one from Nebraska. So we had some that came in and it was like, you know, if you go to shows already, if you play music here, this is a nice reward. You get to go see the rest of the performances. I mean, that's the other thing. All, all musicians also have a wristband that gives them access everywhere all day or all weekend. So um, it's sort of a give back to, hey, you know, this is, this is a cool town. Let's highlight the venues that we have that, that have shows regularly. Let's reward the fans that come out regularly. And let's show people that maybe don't come out a lot that this town has a great scene that, to offer. So yeah, the fans are totally appreciative. You know, that's, you ask why I do this, really for the high fives in the street and for people to say, hey, that was a really cool thing. Um, and that's, that's why I do it. I mean, I started the, the nonprofit's called Music Only Makes Sense because it doesn't make a lot of money as we saw this year. <laughs> but it's okay, you know, I mean, we're still, we're still young, we're still working out kinks. And, and that's the name of the group that puts on Davis Music Fest is? Yeah. Music Only Makes Sense. Or it's moms for short. Moms for short, right. Yeah. And um, uh, so, and we're doing another event, um, which is uh, on October 12th, and we're partnering with the Davis High School Blue and White Foundation. Yeah, and that one will be at Central Park, I think. Yeah, and that one, we do want all you undergrads to come out and have, not, not have your first beer, but come out and enjoy that one. Um, it's a little more like a traditional festival where you have, you know, we're going to actually, um, we're going to, fence off part of Central Park of two stages, have alternating bands, um, beer gardens and food, and you know, it'll be all ages, and uh, it'll be just your traditional type of fest. You know, I, I take your point about uh, uh, Picnic Day, that you don't want this to become, because Picnic Day, it's been a little better the last year or two, but yeah. it just sort of turned into this big outdoor right. beer party. And when we started in 2011, it was on the heels of the real bad year of yeah. Picnic Day. And so when I met with the, the city folks talking about, hey, I have this idea to bring. So we had done a benefit out, actually with Blue and White. So it's kind of coming first full circle. And, and Blue and White is another uh, foundation that benefits right. schools. Right, right. That benefits the high school. And they do all extracurricular activities. They don't just support football in the stadium. That project's done now. In fact, they just sent, um, they sent a bunch of kids from Madrigals to Italy. The Blue and White Foundation. So they do, you know, I think that they're doing a good job of, of uh, bringing highlights to the, the impact they have on all students. Anyway, we did a benefit show after their traditional golf tournament several years ago, and that's how I got into do, booking any bands or doing any shows. But, and, but I, was, I was getting a sense you were starting to tell a story that uh, in 2011, uh, you go to the city, you say you want to do this, and they're thinking, we just survived picnic day. What exactly. Are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. And it was like, well, so what, what, what are them? your plans? Well, it was, it was, you know, this is going to be small. That's how we reassure them. Yeah. You know, okay. I go to shows and there are 20 people standing around watching this killer band, and I can't believe it. So it's, you know, I don't expect a whole lot of people, you know, in the first year or two. And then I was pretty blown away last year in tw in, tw in 2012. We did. We had close to 1,500 people, and so I thought, oh wow, this is, you know. Let's do more bands. Let's do more venues. And I just so, overestimated a little. It wasn't too bad. But so, <laughs> so what's your story? I mean, how did you end up doing this? How did you develop this love for music? And why Davis? I mean, did you grow up here? No, I didn't grow up here. I married into Davis. It's funny. I actually met my my ex-wife at uh, Picnic Day in 1995. <laughs> and uh, so you came to town for Picnic Day. I came to town for Picnic Day. I was living in San Francisco. I've always loved music. I've always liked going to concerts. To me. Um, is that, that what you do for a living? Do you? No, I'm in technology. Okay. Technology sales. So software this is sales. just uh, something yeah. you really enjoy doing on the side. And this actually is an outlet for me because in business I do a lot of over the phone and online and don't actually shake hands with folks. Um, so this gives me at night and on weekends and have meetings and I can actually, you know, be part of the community um, in that sense of actually doing something. But yeah, it was just you know I was going to shows and liking it and thought. I do you know, I, I know we're getting near the end, but uh, but Sarah, who's not here tonight, had told Landon <laughs> Christensen something interesting in the Davis Enterprise, uh, and I bet you have an opinion about this too. And I I, I want to just read. Uh, this is a story that he had written about the Davis the Music Fest, yep. and uh, she told him it's a little bit magical, helping the kids, helping the downtown businesses, 
There's that element that's really enduring and special. This is Sarah talking here, folks. <laughs> Our town of Davis is really invested in the arts. She says, five years from now, Davis is going to be a tour stop for bands along the way. It'll be built into tour schedules. She says, there's a lot of room to grow, and I feel Davis is ready for it. I mean, and that's one of the big questions, isn't it, in, in Davis is, you know, we've got a lot of music. Over the years, we've had sort of upswellings of music. I mean, we had the Palms in town for years. Yep. We moved to Winners. Freeborn Hall put on a lot of concerts. Mondavi does now. We used to have venues downtown. Do you think Davis is about to grow in terms of its musical presence? And if so, why now? Um, well, I think, yes, first off, I think we are starting to see, a, a, you know, acts like Mandavi's doing a really good job of, of bringing more rock and roll type acts to, um, to the Mandavi Arts Center. It's not just symphonies. I think that uh, there is a big contingency of people that from Sacramento or Davis that will drive to the city, uh, being San Francisco, to, uh, to see a show. And, you know, it's kind of like why the Davis Live Music Collective formed. It's let's get, um, let's bring the acts here. It's a stopping, it's a natural stop between San Francisco and Portland, add a day and do a stopover. And um, after that quote in the paper, I, I said they already are. And it's true. I mean, you told that agents, to Sarah. I told that to Landon. Okay. Uh, so, so the, uh, the. Um, but the sense that I got from the comment is that. Uh, that there's a swell. That we could expect more than we've had even. Yeah, I think so. I think, well, there was a whole conversation about the Dimple space, you know, when yep. Dimple went out of business about making that a venue. It's next to Starbucks downtown, that currently empty building. Yep, and I've had lots of discussions about that, and that's not going to happen in the immediate future, but there's an interest there, whether it's that space or somewhere, to have a, you know, four to 500 capacity venue, um, which is kind of where we don't have uh, that market right now. Um, Mandavi has a 200 person space, there are a lot of 200 to 250 spaces in town. Um, and then you go to Mandavi, the big rooms, like 1,600 people. So um, that. So you think the demand is here, or people absolutely. would come to Davis? Absolutely. I think people are ready to, to, to see shows you know, every weekend, two or three. It just, what it needs to happen is, is different genres need to be present. So you, know, you, you don't want to have an all country bar, an all metal bar, or an all indie, or all folk, or whatever. I think that if you have a promoter who can put in different sort of like Ace of Spades is doing in Sacramento, there's no reason why we couldn't have something like that, especially with the student population. And I'll tell you, one of the things about Freeborn, um, I don't think it's personally a great sounding venue. I like going to shows there. I mean, I've seen one of the best shows of my life there, but um, I think, you know, the fact that it's dry. Okay. So, yeah, I think there's room. Well, we're out of time. So we've been okay. talking with Danny Tomasello. I warned you, I can talk for, you know, for hours about this He's stuff. the uh, founder <laughs> of the Davis Music Fest. I'm Bill Buchanan. This has been in the studio of Davis Media Access. Thank you for listening. Yes, thank you, DMA.